Hello everybody, thank you so much for tuning in for this week's Shoes Miss Live video. Today I'm joined by Caroline White Robinson. Hello. And uh, we're going to be talking about the top skills that you need to be successful in a law firm. So we're going to be covering skills for both law and non-lawyers um, in a law firm. So this should be applicable to anybody that is watching today. So before we get started, welcome Caroline. Thank you for and having me. Thanks for coming. Um, I would love just to hear a little bit about you and okay. how you came to be at Shoesmiths. Okay, so uh, start with the really important stuff. Uh, I've got four kids and a dog, a little puppy, um, and I've always worked full time. So my I've managed to juggle over uh, life, the, the kids, and um, just putting most of me into my career as well. Um, I've come through a really untraditional route, I suppose, into law. Um, I started off by um, uh, doing a science degree on the back of um, some disappointing A-level results, um, and that was definitely an experience that I learned from. But I did a science degree, I came out of that um, thinking I'd be a scientist, and then found that I hated it. So at that point, 21, 22, you realise you've got to do something different, um, and I ended up in retail management for Toys R Us. So having spent a couple of years learning the, the, the roots of management, um, I then decided I'd worked really hard for my degree and I needed to do something with it. So I ended up in pharmaceutical sales um, and spent two years working with some fantastic clinicians around the, the whole of the country on really exciting products, um, both new and old, so, um, learning the skills of um, what it took to be a professional um, working in a highly regulated in industry and working with doctors who obviously were making life and death decisions, so mm. in a very pressurised environment. Um, and I loved it. Um, and the beauty of working in pharmaceuticals is that they would allow me to actually move around with my skill set. So I got to move from a sales and operations perspective, then they put me into a marketing role. So I got to um, launch a, a fantastic drug that's a household name now. So I learned pieces of marketing. Then I went into HR and I did a piece in HR and then I eventually settled in L&D. So that's how I've come to be here today because there's a parallel between what um, doctors need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is work in a high, highly pressurized intellectual mm -hmm. environment, um, but also they have to Run, run staff meetings, look after staff, recruit people, look after the patients, do media, do research, etc. And there's all of these other skills that they have to do. And that's very similar to working in a law firm. Um, because as you become more senior, you don't just do the law. You have to work with your clients and do all of those other things yep. as well. Okay, fantastic. So um, we're filming from our Northampton office mm -hmm. today um, and we want to know where are you watching us from. So if you can just type into the comments and let us know where are you watching us from. Um, and if you think you've got a friend or a colleague who should be tuning in to learn about skills you need to work in the law firm, then just tag them in the comments as well so they can watch. And if they're not available to come and watch now at lunchtime, they can jump on later and watch the rebroadcast after we are not live anymore. Um, okay, so you've been at Shoesmiths for 13 years. Uh -huh. um, have you always been based in Northampton? Um, my home base is Northampton, but um, as we've seen the, the business grow and the offices grow, I'm really excited every time we open a new office and that means that I end up doing a lot of travel up and down the country um, but I find that quite exciting and exhilarating because it's a different place with different people um, and you're constantly seeing how different parts of the business are growing and uh, taking on new exciting challenges so whether that's opening our office in Manchester and being a new presence there or moving into Scotland and indeed moving to Belfast which is my hometown from the accent that's always been very exciting so I think it's it's always shown me the amount of opportunity there has so I don't mind the travel but yes home is Northampton yeah okay um, and for anybody who's not who's watching who's not clear on the different types of role that's available in a law firm that's not a lawyer yeah can you give us a bit of an insight into that Absolutely. So I think that's one of the big misconceptions that uh, law firms are just about the lawyers. Um, as you've heard, I'm a biochemist by trade, and um, that was where I did my science degree in. Um, but actually, there are so many other roles that exist, um, whether it's in marketing, HR, learning and development, um, finance, etc. And, and those people often don't come in with um, a degree. Maybe they've come in with um, an apprenticeship or uh, they've come with, a, come with a different qualification, maybe done through um, ACCA, for example, the, the accounting um, professional qualification. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different ways you can work in a law firm without actually having a law degree. Um, and I think that's one of the beauties that we have here at Shoesmiths. We have such a diversity of people. 
um, they don't think in the same way, they don't always behave in the same way and that's fantastic because um, it does mean that we get really good solutions for our clients but yeah there's a real conception that you have to have a or a misconception that you have to have a law degree and yeah. that's not that's absolutely not the case. And so in that in that time that you've been at Shoesmiths you must have had your role change and develop as well so tell us a little bit about how um, what you were doing when you first came to Shoesmiths and then how does that compare to what you're doing now day to day? Okay so um, my role at Shoesmiths when I first joined was as an L&D manager and that was very much to run what we would have considered soft skills courses and a soft skills course is really something that helps you as an individual develop yourself so your personal confidence um, or your personal effectiveness around time management, prioritisation of skills, um, obviously negotiating as well and um, being working in a team, maybe having to negotiate timelines or deadlines things like that and those skills were really courses that we ran regularly across mm. Smith um, all those years ago um, as as the population grew so we've got more and more people and um, suddenly the pressures on them were slightly different so just as uh, Facebook has come around much more you know with 13 years it wasn't prevalent whenever I first started we needed to give individuals those skills to understand things like social media um, artificial intelligence is coming around, automation, mm -hmm. processing, even the use right down to smartphones, things like that. You know, there are a lot of people who didn't want to have a mobile phone and who struggle with that kind of um, approach because they don't maybe use it an awful lot outside work. So it's my job really to start to think about all of those skills that we need to give people. Um, and over time, the team has grown from essentially what was two of us back 13 years ago um, into a team of 16 now. So, wow. And we've, we're so lucky, you know, we've got a, a digital learning team. Um, we've got, a, again, a team that looks at soft skills and personal development. And then we've got a team that also supports all of our employees with their business systems. So all of the um, things such as Microsoft products, etc., that you would have to use use to do your job we support them with so my role has changed from being probably quite operational in in the room teaching people how to do stuff or working with them from a coaching perspective more into um, a much higher role in terms of uh, thinking broadly about what we need to do as a, as a business mm. um, and that 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 broadened out from just the person to also the legal and technical expertise that they need to have and the knowledge that we need to have within the business and again it's not always just the legal stuff it's the technical knowledge that they have around the best way that clients want to be billed, for example, because that's a, a, a need that our client has mm -hmm. and we have to have the right knowledge for that. And if there's a way that they want to do it and it's not our way, then we need to adapt and change to that. So my role has, has got bigger insofar as I've now taken on responsibility for knowledge management as well. So it's an exciting it's an exciting place to work and no two weeks are the same. Yeah, and I guess even looking at the basics of, of training, um, people might think about training where people are sat in a classroom environment, maybe with a computer, and then a trainer at the front. But now there's a lot of online learning. And you yeah. said about a digital learning team, and there's, I guess, a much broader range of learning types and ways to get information yeah. to people. So absolutely, and I think what I've seen probably over the last 13 years is that um, we've moved away from kind of having training events which is just a one-off thing um, into much more development plans for individuals so they will take a, a training event as a one part of their development but they'll have to go away and they'll work on it so mm. I suppose um, I know you and I were chatting beforehand we were talking about the fact that when you're at university and you 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 do that then you've got to come away and you've got to put that knowledge that experience into the context of it's not just one thing it should let you build on other things mm. and that's very much where the development plan is is aimed at at Chief Smith you yeah know, we have these events but actually it should form much more of an organic plan for you as an individual to help you grow with the speed of change that's happening in our environment and with our clients and what they want Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's a fantastic intro into um, sort of knowledge, learning and development and your role and the change um, we've seen at Shoesmiths over the last 10 to 15 years. So um, don't forget that our application form is open right now for our Insight Evening. So if you are interested in a career um, in law, <clears throat> then you can apply um, on our website by the 30th of November. And we'll share that link in the comments uh, after this video for you. Um, we also have an amazing competition running at the moment where you can win work experience, you can win uh, an invite to the one of those insight evenings you can win a mentoring session with a partner and lunch with our trainee solicitors so they're all fantastic opportunities to get to meet us get to know us and if you're a person who feels like you maybe aren't able to sell your skills best on an application form but you want to get in front of people then this competition is a great way of being able to do that so all you need to do is follow us on Facebook and Instagram and then enter your details into a page with a few multiple choice questions it's really simple and I will share that link for you uh, 
that in the comments for this video as well. But if you want to find it, it is on our Facebook and Instagram page too. Um, so you can ask us questions at any time in this video and we are going to answer them live for you. But let's get into the main kind of um, meat of what we want to talk about today, which is five top skills that you need to work in a law firm. Okay. And we talked about this before and how these are skills that we think are applicable to anybody that works in a law firm, whether you're um, in HR or finance team or you are a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get started, okay. number one. So the, the biggest one for anybody starting a new job in a law firm, um, I think the biggest thing that I could say to them to, to have in, in their toolkit is to have what we call appreciative inquiry. And that is a curious nature, you know, being inquisitive as to what does that do or why do we do it that way, it, you know, in a nice way. This is not kind of interrogation. This is, this is just really being interested in your environment, interested in the people that you're working with and uh, understanding more broadly what clients are up to or why we're doing things in a certain way so that you look, you look um, keen and um, interested in the subject matter, matter. There's nothing worse than somebody coming in for a job and you can tell within you know, a few weeks that they just they don't really want to be here. They're not interested in in whatever it is they've been asked to do, and um, those individuals don't tend to succeed. To be honest with you, mm. because there are other people around them who are constantly asking questions, providing solutions, or giving commentary in terms of you know maybe we could do it this way or that way, etc. So I think that would be my first one. I love that. So what do you call that? Appreciative, Appreciative inquiry. Okay, fantastic. And I love that actually for networking events and insight evenings. That's yeah that's kind of what you need to be doing is putting yourself out there asking questions gaining that information absolutely I mean one of the first things we say when people are networking is if somebody has taken time to actually talk to you 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 give them some commentary back around you know I find that really interesting that was really nice to hear or that's given me lots to think about mm. so that they feel like there's a value to them giving them giving you their opinion or giving you their time um, there's nothing worse than than standing talking to somebody and they look bored or they because you think to yourself I'm a really busy person. Why on earth? Yeah. You know, I, I'm giving up my time to be at a networking event so that we can mutually get benefit from this and I'm not I'm not getting anything back from you. So that's very important. Okay, so this is a fantastic moment for me to say. If you <laughs> loved Caroline's first top tip there for appreciative inquiry, then just hit that love heart um, and let us know. Give us the feedback if you like that top tip. Okay, so number two. Number two would definitely be listening. Um, I think when you start a new job, so you've asked lots of questions, you're in a nice way, and then you've got to listen to the answers that you're given. Um, somebody once told me when I worked in sales that you've been given two ears and one mouth and to use them in that ratio. So, um, because you'll actually gain more brownie points for actually listening and listening thoroughly. Um, and that, I guess, is really important when you're being given instructions on how to do something or um, you know, you've got a procedure or a, po a policy to follow. Really having that thorough understanding and listening properly mm -hmm. means that you get better results at the end. Um, and unfortunately, we see a confidence issue when people don't listen properly and then they walk away and they go, Mm, I'm really not sure whether or not I got that right or um, do I have a go and I don't want to go back and I don't want to ask any more questions so I'll kind of muddle through and then unfortunately they you know they produce something and their line manager kind of then looks at them and says that's not quite what I was asking for and if they just spent a little bit more time listening mm. um, and we talk about active listening because anybody can sit and put a screensaver face on and smile um, but that that's means what I'm doing now. <laughs> but that you know, that's the kind of thing that you can chuck at your partner and say to them, <laughs> "What do you want for tea?" And they'll say, "Whatever." And you just know they're not listening to you at all. So yeah, actively listening is about nodding, smiling, engaging, and sometimes repeating back or asking questions to make sure you've understood. So listening is so important. Okay, thank you. I feel like I should ask a question back now <laughs> to make sure I was listening. Um, right, number three. Number three. Well, I guess this is so important in any role in any firm. But um, being trustworthy in a law firm goes without saying. Um, we we run with such a high level of confidentiality uh, for our clients um, that it's so important to be trustworthy. I guess there's the confidentiality point, but there's also the idea that when you're in a work in a busy place, people have to know that they can count on you. So when you're given something to do, you ask the right questions, you listen to what you've got to do, and then you just get on with it and mm. get it done. Um, and obviously, if you get stuck, then you ask for help, etc. But I think there are too many people who who say they'll do stuff, and then it never happens. And once you've been let down two or three times, it really erodes the trust that you have in them. And particularly for individuals who want to be successful and want to do that quickly, 
they are the ones that then repeatedly perform time and time again. Mm. You know you can give them something, they'll just get on and they'll deliver it. Mm. Um, and that can be something really simple from a big project to Sam needs a CV for this particular event or something like that, and you get it on time, yeah. and you get it beforehand, and you don't have to spend loads of your time chasing, chasing, chasing. Because sometimes it's really frustrating having to chase somebody for something thinking this isn't for my benefit this is for your benefit so you should actually step up be trustworthy and get it done yeah I guess um thinking about it in terms of the role of a trainee solicitor and a supervisor the more um kind of the better listening the better the work that's produced and the more trustworthy the the partner or the supervisor is in then giving that work and the more work that trainee gets the better their development so it's that cycle yeah absolutely and it's exactly the same if I have somebody who's joining the learning and development team we do take people in at a graduate level for example to help us develop our um, learning and development videos Mm -hmm. our uh, e-learning etc and if they've asked for a project and they get it done I'm so much more likely to give them new and exciting projects because I know I can trust them if they ask for a project and I I go out of my way to find them something new and exciting to help them develop their skills and then they let me down on it that's a whole different conversation mm. and it's not one that not either of us want to have because as a line manager you want people to succeed all of yeah. the time so okay fantastic um so we're on to number four number four number four, four would always be um show keenness and that can come in many guises it's showing willing it's showing um enthusiasm um i think sometimes uh, that's an extra skill that people forget that, that, that lights up a room, lights up a party, if that makes sense. Mm. Somebody just being really engaged, really enthusiastic, um, can take off on a dry or a difficult subject or, or project and bring it to life. You know, it's that enthusiasm. And I think we've got it in abundance here at Shoesmiths. I think it's something we do really well, even when it's tricky, you know. Some of the some of the things we have to deal with on a day to day basis are tricky subjects. Life doesn't always um, throw us peachy peachy you know uh, dream projects all of mm. the time. Sometimes things are hard. Sometimes there's, things are difficult. You know recessions come and go, and that means that you've got to grit down. But if you can do that with a smile on your face and an enthusiasm to work together as a team, really drive th- drive forward together. So nobody's isolated and um, everybody feels like they've got a part to play. I think that's really important. So yeah, an, uh, an abundance of enth- enthusiasm. Okay, um, and I think there's elements of everybody's job, isn't there, that mm. aren't the best bits. Mm. Um, but they still need to be done because they're part of that package. So absolutely, absolutely. doing those bits with a smile as well as the enjoyable bits. Completely, completely. In any in any in any regulated environment, there are always things that you've just got to do. Yeah, that's just reminded me. I need to submit my expenses. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and finally, we are on to number five. Number five. Okay, so. The, I guess number five really encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about because to be a great team player, you've got to listen well, you've got to question, um, you've got to be keen and willing. So being a team player, people often look at sports teams as a um, and, a, and a good example of what a, a good team player looks like. But for me, there are analogies with it, but also I think the, the evolving role of teams is changing in the workplace. So in, it's not your 15 people that have been chosen and they will stay those 15 people. It is much more like rug, rolling substitutions. So it, because we're much more project-based than we've ever been before, it means that you have to come on and off teams depending on what's happening in the business. Yeah. Um, and that's at the heart of our strategy. You know, We talk about collaboration, and that is it's so important as a team player to be able to Get, get yourself onto a team, establish rapport with people, be interested in what they're doing and how mm. they're doing it, build that trust between you so that you can work on that project together and then maybe next month be working on something else with another set of individuals. Um, so yeah, being a team player but in a slightly different way to the way we've thought about it in the past yeah. I suppose. I think um, something that we talk about a lot with tra- our trainee solicitors is building a personal brand mm. and kind of getting your name out there about what you're known for and how people perceive you and that sometimes seems like a bit of a a tick box exercise to do and just something that you need to do at the beginning and then that's it but it then really does develop into those networks and then when you're jumping in and out of teams you're already got those relationships that people know you people know what you're all about that you're trustworthy um, and it makes it so much easier then to be part of those projects yeah I mean that whole that whole personal brand thing is so so important because I think it was Jeff Bezos from Amazon said you know a personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room you know so those qualities that we've been talking about whether you're a good listener or 
you're keen, you're willing, and you're prepared to be part of a team. Those are the kinds of things that people will say when you're mm. not in the room. You know, oh, be careful on that one because you know they're they they say they're part of the team, but actually when it comes down to it, they're they're out for themselves. Or you can kind of hear that, and I've certainly heard that many times in previous employ, um, employers. So that personal brand, you really have to think about being genuine to yourself first and foremost, but then thinking about the actions that you take and how that mirrors your actual values and who you are as an individual. Mm. Um, And also the things, the activities that you put in place, whether they absolutely um, work for you or may have a consequence, even if it's an unintended consequence of being a negative thing. So we talk very much about your digital footprint, what you write, how you put yourself online, what's likely to come back up in the in the past you know from the past etc because you just never know in fact we were talking today weren't we about the fact that I've seen a brochure for something and my face is on it and I don't you know I remember the event but I don't remember the photograph being taken so it's a great example of where you know making sure my face is associated with something that I'm happy to be associated with Mm. you have to manage that because these things can pop up wherever Um, and of course you know great people will ask two or three questions to understand or but then other people might just take a judgment mm. so personal brands are really important yeah okay perfect thank you that was really insightful and all um links incredibly well with the values of the firm so um if you're looking to apply for an insight evening back scheme or training contract you'll be thinking about the firm's values and how they align with your own so i think that's been amazing um, advice and will really feed well into any of the competency based answers that Mm. people are putting on their application forms or preparing for an assessment centre so I just want to tell you about another resource um, where you can find out a bit more information about skills and law careers so I'm starting my own um, YouTube channel and you can find that at youtube.com forward slash Samantha Hope number one Um, so I will link that for you at the bottom so yeah would love if you would head over there and hit the subscribe button in the first video for that is coming out this week and it's all about social media and Facebook Live. So if you're watching this now, you will probably be interested in watching that. Um, so if you've got any questions for us, you can type them into the comments now and we are going to come to your questions in just one second. But I just want to ask, Caroline, do you have a question for me? Um, yeah, I think I think it would be really interesting to hear. You know, you obviously work with graduates much more than I do. Um, what, are, what would you say the, um, the biggest area for development is? You know, going from university into into an employee an employer what's the biggest challenge for them so I think that coming from um, a kind of a learning environment where you've been at university and perhaps postgraduate and then certainly coming into a, a graduate scheme job which is all is also structured is that they are so structured that learning environment and the kind of first grad type job is normally quite structured and so um, you always have key points that you're aiming for so your first year at uni and then your second year your final year um, and so on and then once you get to becoming a trainee solicitor you're aiming for the six month seat move mm. and so on um, <clears throat> and I think sometimes it can very much feel like you're um, ticking the boxes as you go through and trying to get from one point to the next point point. Okay. and I think when you come into then a working environment um, you can feel a little bit almost a bit lost like you're out of the structure now you're mm. not getting that uh, you've not got those key points necessarily to, to be working for um, or certainly that other people are put on you it's now for mm. you to put those key points in place set your own objectives um, for, for things that you want to reach and then being able to apply that knowledge mm-hmm. so it, because it becomes less structured you need to really take the knowledge that you're applying from or take the knowledge that you're learning from those life experiences and apply them yeah. so that you can be successful. Yeah. So, for example, a really easy one is um, that we say, OK, um, go to a networking event. And the, the goal of that is for you to build relationships, maintain relationships, develop networks for people that you might work with in the future. And that will give you a benefit later on. Mm. The benefit might not be immediate, um, but some people can view that and say, OK, go to a networking event. OK, I did it. Tick. Done. And that's yeah. it. And it's done then. But it, it's not. It's something that needs to really develop with you yeah. in your career. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I, I think one of the things we talk about are emotional credits in the bank account. You know, sometimes when you help somebody, I, it's not automa- you don't automatically get a, um, kudos for it or you know, you're not, your name doesn't go up in lights for it and it takes effort to help other people. But actually by dropping those emotional credits in, somebody says, you, you helped me out of a sticky patch then and over time you build that so that when you get to a point and you say, do you know what, Sam, I could really do with a bit of support, you've got enough emotional credits in the bank account that you actually want to help me. Mm. But again, that's like networking, 
where it's not doesn't pay off just yeah. there today. It's, you've got to build on it. Yeah. So. Yeah, and sometimes it can feel like, oh, okay, so I've been to the networking event. Where's my training contract now? Yeah. But it's, it's a building up of all those things. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you have any questions that you want to ask the audience, Caroline? Um, because people can comment back with their, their answers. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest with you, uh, the two questions. One would be, do you even know or did you realise that a learning and development team existed within any employment employers? Because um, I don't think we're very well publicised. I think people, when they join, just assume that they'll be doing their job and they won't maybe have to develop or there won't be any support for development. I guess that's the first one. And then secondly, it'd be really interesting to hear what your views are around what what's the gap in terms of what people need from development you know we've got all these structured programs you can go off and you can do a master's degree in this or whatever but I'm very conscious having had you know I've got four children I learn as many skills from my seven-year-old around technology um, as I did my 22 year old when they were using the first kind of iPads etc and it's constantly evolving it's constantly moving and I think the, the challenge for us is, as employers is to keep up to date with everything that's coming through so if you've got ideas and you think to yourself yeah employers should be doing more around social mobility or gender balance and these are the topics these are the hot core topics that we as future employees really want to make sure that our employers are you know educating us about or talking to us about then I'd love to hear that because mm. that all needs to fit into our development strategy yeah um, you know there's there's I'm really proud to say that our diversity here at Houston is fantastic but we've run programs in the past to make sure that people understand what diversity is you know because it does move and it does change mm. and I'll, I'll use a phrase this week and my 12 or 13 year old will look at me and go that's so yesterday and I'll think how did that ha how did how did that change happen a piece of language has changed and I'm now out of date so I guess keeping up to date with that would be really interesting to hear their views yeah so you can type into the comments your answers for Caroline and even if you're watching this on YouTube or after the live broadcast you can still comment we still do go on here and look and respond um, so that's just reminded me my two-year-old he um, he's nearly three and he occasionally uses the iPad and he has a, like a flight simulator game mm -hmm. on that he loves um, and yesterday morning he spotted the iPad on the bedside and he said um, I'd really like to do some eye padding. Eye padding. I thought if that isn't a proper word, that should be a word soon. Absolutely. So I quite like it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to use it as a verb. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've you know again, <clears throat> it's high different th different um, different generations. You know, I was re mostly embarrassed when my girls were very small. You know, mum and dad were their first words. When Ethan was very small, his first word was iPad and no. And that was because the other children were taking it off him. So, you know, it, it does move and it does change. But he said to me the other day, he could tell me what a black hole was and how that had developed. And I asked him where he'd find that information. And he said, I saw it on some YouTube thing. So, yeah. you know, I think sometimes people look at technology and they think it's a bad thing. I actually think it's a great thing. You know, he, I would never have been able to describe to him what a black hole was in the same way that he described it to me. Yeah. He just got it. Yeah, so. that's great. Joshua definitely knows his planes, that is for sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so we are going to have a look and see if you guys have asked us any questions that you'd like us to answer. So just bear with me um, two seconds while I have a look. Um, so we've got some people watching us from... Uh, Laura's watching us from Leeds. Hi, Laura. Sophia from Manchester. Uh, Polly's watching from Liverpool. Liberty's watching from Nottingham. Fantastic. You guys are everywhere. Uh, Laura's watching from London. Um, hi Lynn in Birmingham and Kirsty's in London too um, so if lots you've of got ladies I can see today. lots of yeah, ladies lots yeah of ladies. if you've got any questions do type them in um, I had a couple of questions that I did want to ask you mm -hmm. so um, firstly what do you think differentiates Shoesmiths as a law firm okay. from competitors um, there's a phrase on our website which I love and we and I use it day in day out which is um, we don't tolerate any pomposity or arrogance and that has stuck with me and everybody that I have recruited into learning and development um, and knowledge management we st we stick by that and and what that means is we we don't behave in that way and also if you find somebody else ever behaves in that way you have complete license and authority to challenge that mm. and I think that makes us really special because. Um, I just, I just think it's a, it's rude, and you don't need to be rude. It, it, there's no need for it. There's no place for it, and particularly in business, yes, it can be pressurised, etc. But a level of arrogance, you know, knowledge is not power anymore. Because if that were the case, my seven-year-old has access to all knowledge in the world, mm. more knowledge than I will ever have had at that age. So, I think it's really, it's about our people, it's about our culture, and it's about our approach. 
know, we don't run a hierarchical system here. We don't have desks for the CEO. You know, we don't have car parking spaces that you must never park in because they're designated for somebody. You know, and we're very respectful of other people. Mm. So I would definitely say that the environment within which we work, you know, I hear some horror stories. Um, and I hear just how different people are treated, particularly when they're more junior in their career um, and about the, the hours that they work or the way that they're spoken to. Um, it does fill me with horror, the whole kind of hashtag Me Too campaign that's happening mm -hmm. at the minute, not just, you know, in, in the media world, but also in law um, and some of the some of the other industries that which a lot of people are, are, are looking under stones and that. I've never experienced that at Shoe Smith, and I'm really proud of that. Um, as somebody who is a custodian of the values, and we talk about them on our programmes all of the time, I've never been in a situation where I've actually really had to challenge somebody and say, you're buying out of order. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that comes through our recruitment process and the great work that your team does. Um, it comes through our recruitment process when we recruit our partners and the, and the rigour that we expect of them. Um, and certainly the, the other areas, you know, as a line manager, all of our interview questions are competency based around our values, etc. And that keeps it alive, I yeah. think. Okay, perfect. Um, a really nice summing up of the culture at Shearsmith and what how because I think law firms quite often talk about their culture and what a lot of businesses do, and um, we certainly do in terms of that makes us different. But quite often people don't go into as much detail, and I think that's really explained it really nicely. Um, how is the strategy addressing changes in the legal market? So particularly around a really topical point at the moment about AI and tech um, and keeping people up to date. So I guess two questions out of that is how is Shoesmiths um, approaching that and then how is your team Okay, approaching it. So um, I guess, uh, gosh, the change curve that we're going through is absolutely massive. Um, technology is really hitting our sector, um, our industry more so than I've ever experienced in any other um, industry I've worked in, the, the way in which we deliver legal services will have to change, and we know that, um, and there's a real energy and drive for that to happen at Shea Smith, because that's the way, what our clients want, and we are a service business, we have to deliver mm. what our clients want, because they've got to deliver a legal product to their employers, as it were. So we are moving through a real period of change. Um, artificial intelligence will change the way in which we deliver legal services, but we also have to get our own people comfortable with what artificial intelligence is, what automation is all about, um, and the use of algorithms. I mean, whoever thought we'd be talking about algorithms in law, but you know, all of that good stuff, we need to educate our, indi our individuals. Um, and also look for people who've got passion in that area, mm. because if you've got passion for the law, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're great at writing um, computer programs or developing these algorithms etc so we need specialists we will be recruiting specialists into our business so you know in terms of business analysts and um, program analysts that we're going to see more and more people come into law firms on, on the back of that uh, because it's just going to be part of the, the transformation that we have in terms of what we're doing um, the so within my role uh, we're now we've just set up the shoes miss academy and i'm looking forward to being able to talk about that now because it's been a well-kept secret for a long time so this is first off the press actually you're the Ooh. first people that have heard about this <laughs> um but the shoes miss academy in in terms of dealing with the change that we got we've got we recognize that the sqe is coming we recognize that um apprenticeship levy is in place and we should be using apprentices much more than we've ever done in the past um, and we should be utilising um, and working on the back of the, the, the policies the government have put in place around apprenticeships etc. Um, we also appreciate that law is quite a it's quite a privileged world in many respects because there's been access to education there's mm. been access to funding um, and not everybody gets that opportunity so you know we need to reach out now and work with groups and communities where perhaps that's not the the, the starting point for them um, and the academy is there to do that and we, we want to work with people internally and we've got a load of people who are really interested who are happy to give of their time their skills and knowledge to be able to share that with um, children who are in um, either um, economically deprived areas or um, socially areas where it's a, a bit of a challenge for them so that we can start and ignite some potential in them ignite some belief in them that they mm. can do they can work in a law firm be that in the post room or be that as a lawyer if they've got the capability but I think for a lot of people they switch off to the idea of working in the law firm because they're not a grade A student mm. and and the academy is there to build on that so we're really looking forward to be able to give some of those skills courses that we talked about previously 
give individuals the belief, the confidence, the skills, some coaching around how to behave because you know not everybody's brought up in the same way that we are, um, to enable them to, to have a, a, a an option to join a law firm. And, and that for me is really powerful because it's not just about the one one spectrum of highly intelligent, capable people, but also about what we give back to our communities mm. um, and how we grow potential insight and confidence in others. Yeah. So if um, there's people watching now that are interested in learning a bit more about the Shoesmiths Academy, where could they find information about that? Will it be on the website or will there be a bit more information coming out? Yeah, so there'll be there'll be lots of things happening over the next year. We have, um, if you want to go to the Shoesmiths website, you'll find some information um, there. If you've got any questions, I'd be really delighted to hear from anybody. Just pop me a line and ask me some questions. That would be fantastic. Um, there will be more things that we'll be putting on the website as they launch, so events that will be happening and um, that you potentially could get involved in. Um, you know, give us your insight as well. Tell us where you see challenges in the communities that you've been um, in at, at university. Mm. You know, we know there's a lot of dropouts at university from mental health issues because of the pressure and the stress of exams. Maybe there's something we could be doing there to help and support in those areas. Um, you know, we're looking for opportunities, so always really pleased to hear from everybody. Yeah, perfect. Um, that was really interesting and a nice secret to share oh, on, there you go. online today. Um, so I don't think any more... Let me just refresh this, because sometimes there is a delay in the questions coming through, and I think there's no questions when there is. So just bear with me a second... There is questions. Um, fantastic. Right. Okay. Let's so let's do a few of these. So, um, um, Amul has asked, "What transferable skills do you have? Do you most look out for in candidates? And has there been any particular skill, however unusual, that piqued your interest or that you found surprising?" Wow. What a great question. Yeah, that's amazing. That's an amazing <laughs> question. I'm going to have to really think about that. Um, First off, I think it's really difficult to differentiate yourself. I, th I do. I genuinely think it is hard because there are so many of you um, that come through. But that said, you mustn't take, be disheartened by that because actually so many of those candidates who do come through lack a keenness to want to be here. It's almost like they're, they're doing it because somebody's told them they've got to put it on mm. a form. Um, sometimes they they don't really... They don't really engage with the day and with the people, and I think that's a real shame because you should employ, you should interview us as much as we interview them. Yeah. Um, and I'm recruiting at the minute, and it, there's a real difference in candidates between those who have got come prepared with questions for me about the role and about shoesmiths versus those individuals who say, no, I've got no questions. And I think, but you want to work here, and you might work here for five years, two years, however, and that's a long, a long bit of your week <laughs> that you're going to be stuck with people if you don't like us then that's a difficult place mm. to be. So I think, yeah, transferable skills, when you engage with anybody, learn about what they do, t show real interest in what they do. Um, I've had people ask me what I do, and as soon as they've heard that I'm not a partner, it's almost like I don't exist. But what they don't understand is I have, you know, I have direct contact with all of the partners in Shoesmith and all of the board members in Shoesmith. And those kinds of interactions do leave a little bit of a, oh, okay, well clearly you're a hierarchical person and we're not a hierarchical kind of business so I think mm. yeah you know show genuine interest in people and that will take you a long way and we'll start to drop in those emotional credits um, and if you're not sure about something you know don't let nerves get the better of you for asking a question because they're, they're the only stupid questions are the ones that aren't asked and asking a question particularly on an assessment day if that's what if you're coming in for you know one of our um, trainee contracts etc then asking the questions much better. Would you agree with that? Yeah, asking the questions are much better yeah. than going in blind. Yes, we love people that ask questions. So type us a question now, please. Yeah, and if you you know if you're ever asked to do a team a team um, event, when I know when I'm doing development things, I can't ever assess anybody if they say nothing. Yeah, you know you're in, as part of a team. You've got to show that you can actually engage with other people, and that might be asking questions or eye contact or challenging somebody, but in a nice way. If you don't do any of that then as somebody who, who kind of assesses people's ability, you've actually given me nothing to assess. And I think a lot of that comes from practice and throwing yourself mm. into environments where you don't know anybody and perfect places for that, networking events. Absolutely. That might feel scary, but do you know what? It's all practice. It's all, it's not ticking that box. It's getting that experience for later use. Absolutely. So people laugh because in between doing my degree and actually starting as a retail manager, um, I was a Butlins Redcoat. 
Yeah, so lifeguard during the day and did a bit of singing in the evening. And people couldn't believe that I'd done a science degree and then I was going to go and, you know, play jazz hands, as they said. But interacting with so many different types of people <clears throat> who were all there for different reasons, you know, employees, holiday makers, kids. Oh, my goodness, the, the skills that it gave you, you know, handling crises when a child has just been sick everywhere and mm. you're the first person to have to deal with it, right through to a lost child or somebody who's imbibed a little bit too much and you've got to try and get them back to their accommodation you know that all of those transferable skills are really important because it means you don't get flustered in a crisis and it, it means you don't get panicked about things so yeah all of the all of the jobs that you have bring those to life when you're in interview but don't just talk about the fact that you shoveled chips into a you know, a, a carton, talk about the fact that you appreciated rules and regulations around hot fat, you know, make it business orientated to bring yeah. it to life. But Perfect. Okay, so uh, Sophia has, um, she said she loved number three, which was, hold on, I need to check, trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, uh, do what you say you will do. Um, how do you avoid fail, sorry, it's tiny writing. How do you avoid falling into the trap of doing your own job and carrying others who don't always do what they say they'll do, because you're reliable and you have the and you have that trust. It can mean your workload is bigger than an, a, a colleague. So basically, how do you deal with um, you're getting a lot of work because you're trustworthy and people like you, um, and you're sort of having to carry a colleague basically. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing is don't get disheartened because those colleagues <laughs> will get found out at some point. Um, secondly, don't always take everything on your own shoulders. Um, sometimes there's, we talk about a, um, how a strength can become a weakness. Um, and what we mean by that is when a strength becomes overdone, so if I really, really want to um, help and support people, then if I overdo that, they'll never do it for themselves. I'll just constantly do it for them. And then that becomes my weakness because I become pressured, stressed, tired, etc. So... It's obviously a strength, you know, for some people, but you have to be very clear about some boundaries, you know, and if it does mean that you're working 12, 13 hour days and somebody else is only working a six hour day with a three hour lunch, there's a fairness point in there. At Shoesmiths, we would like to think that our managers would acknowledge that and see that there's an inequality. Mm. Um, I think the beauty of um, some of the way the projects are run at Shoesmiths, it's a real meritocracy, so everybody's given the, the right amount of work for them based on the other stuff they've got going on for different clients, etc., um, or on different projects. But yeah, first of all, don't get disheartened by it. Um, know your boundaries. Talk to the individual, you know, front up and say, actually, I think I'm doing my fair share here. You need to do this bit. Mm. I totally appreciate that's more difficult if somebody's more senior above you. Um, and just remember that somebody else's poor time management does not justify an emergency on your part. So people will try and dump stuff. And you just have to find language that um, says it really nicely, which is, I'm really, I would have loved to have helped, but had you given me more time, that would have been possible. With the workload I've got on at the minute, I just won't be able to do that. And, but, you know, and that's where the, the, the language becomes really important because people say, I'll try and get it done. And what we've actually said to them is, I'm going to do my best to get it done saying with the time we've got left I won't mm. get it done that's much more definite that's saying I'm leaving you in no uncertain terms I can't do this for yeah. you so you need to find somebody else to do it for you you know because that try then turns into pulling an all-nighter or you mm. know going above and beyond or missing your weekend because if you're a helpful person you want to help mm. you want to do that thing and so you're quite often um positive and you're saying i'll try to do it i Absolutely. want to help but actually sometimes it's just not going to be possible yeah yeah okay perfect um so let's see we've got a couple more questions in here <clears throat> So, um, Amaral said, I think it's important to teach graduates about mental health in the workplace. Some people may not feel that they um, can talk to anybody or they couldn't cope. So that's in response to your question totally um, agree, yeah. about development points. Yeah. And we've got mental health champions here at Shoesmiths for that very reason. <clears> so <throat> if you don't feel like you can talk to your, your supervisor, your line manager, there's always a mental health champion in every single office. Mm. At least I think at least one. Um, I think in some offices we have up to seven. Um, there's always a route in through learning and development development through our coaching program if you're if you're um struggling with a particular issue you can access some coaching we've got 
fantastic employee assistant programs um, where uh, you can access counselling um, and uh, tools such as mindfulness um, etc to support um, positive mental health um, strategies and then of course there's always HR as well so we've got a lot of people who are really you know there for you from a mental health perspective. Yeah good support network. Yeah. Um, Brooke has asked, um, she said hi this is Brooke, <coughs> she's from Nottingham and um, thanks for answering the questions Within Shoesmiths, what areas of development have you recognised and what steps are you taking to improve them? Okay, is this for me or for I am the not employees? Sure. Um, so, well, Caroline, I guess if I um, slightly, if we slightly change the question then to um, ask, is there a particular new training or development thing that's going on at the moment so we've talked about the Shoesmiths Academy mm -hmm. but is there I don't, people might be thinking about a particular course where they go in and they do some Excel training or is okay. there anything like that going on okay so there is something that we're, we're looking at at the minute um, it's called design thinking there are a couple of YouTube videos out there um, for it. Um, it's something that was done in pharmaceuticals many, many years ago, and I'll just briefly explain the concept if that's all right. It's thinking about um, if you create a pill for something like uh, arthritis. Mm. Arthritis, yes, of course, uh, younger people get it, but generally osteoarthritis tends to be wear and tear in your joints, so a lot of elderly people get, um, or older people get arthritis. If I'm then going to give you a pill to take every single day and your hands are not functioning particularly well, the type of blister pack that I put it in or the type of jar that I put it in will dictate whether or not you take that every day. Because if you physically can't get into it and you don't have anybody else to help you, you won't take it. Or if it's just too difficult and you're already tired, you'll think, oh, I just can't be bothered today. But if you get, if you get a product that's in a fantastic um, packaging that's really easy for them to use and also helps them remember what days they actually have to take the medication mm -hmm. on that means that they use it and of course if you use it then it works for them then they get symptom relief and and that that really is design thinking at its heart which is the pharmaceutical company might want to make money but ultimately they'll only, only make money if the if the patient is able to take the drug and you have to then think about how are we going to package this to make sure that they can do that and in law our clients are asking us that same question so how are you going to package these legal solutions for us that means that we can access it? Um, a great example of that would be, you know, we work in the UK, but some of our clients will be working internationally. And they'll say, we don't want your UK lawyers to be working 18 hours a day, but we need to have access to the documents if somebody in the US wants to mm. look at them, because actually they're on a different time zone. So we have to think about how we package those legal services. And sometimes that will be technology that we use you know, different sites, um, et cetera, that we have to develop and build because, again, the level I talked earlier about the confidentiality, the fact that we're FCA and SRA regulated, yeah. you know, there are certain things we just can't do, so we have to build things in a different way um, to make sure that our clients actually get the product that they want at the, at the end of it. Um, I think long gone are the days where the senior partner would rock up with 25 juniors behind them because clients would just say, no, we don't want that level of, of people in the room or the number of people. But then how do, you, how do you train those 25 juniors to hear the conversation between those individuals? So we've got to think from a knowledge management perspective, how do we store all of that knowledge so mm. that people who are more junior are able to get access to that wealth of experiential knowledge? So yes, I'd say that the biggest change is design thinking and how we change what the clients need. And that's where we need you guys, to be perfectly honest with you, because our lawyers who came out with law degrees... 25 30 years ago weren't thinking about this stuff you should be thinking about this now you should mm. be thinking about the impact of technology and how it can help us improve what we're doing for our clients because you're the fresh brains just as my seven-year-old will tell me i've done this update for you or i've done <laughs> that download for you that's great because he can do it and i can just get on with doing something else yeah so a lawyer's job is certainly not just the law anymore but it's law and no. business management and future thinking design thinking and so many more skills that we need in our future lawyers yeah now coming abs in. absolutely and non-law people that work in law firms absolutely yeah absolutely. wow that was a fantastic answer um and 
I think um, so Sophia said thank you and Emma will say thank you as well so if you've got any questions you can of course just pop them into the comments and we will respond to you anything that comes in after we've gone live um, I will email to Caroline and uh, she will email me the answer to put back to you yeah. um, so just a quick reminder that our application form for our Insight Evening is open right now it's a fantastic way to get your foot inside the firm um, and learn a little bit more about us so do head over there I'm going to share the link for our Insight Evening I'm going to share the link for our our work experience competition and I'm gonna share the link for my new YouTube channel as well so you can go and subscribe um, but finally Caroline thank you so much it's thank been you. I've learned so much so <laughs> I know these guys will have as well well thank you so much for having me I feel really bad that I've not given you a prize for your for your competition <laughs> maybe that's something we can talk about and then yeah, for in the we future can have an maybe, add -on. yeah you can have an add-on prize from learning and development yeah maybe yeah. it's a book or something like okay, that okay that would be good yeah yeah okay perfect so thank you so much join us next time on facebook live um we're going to be live on tuesday the 3rd of december at 12 30 um and you're going to have the chance to meet one of our first year trainee solicitors i think from our birmingham office um so you have the chance to ask her any questions um that you want. Um, but thank you so much and see you again soon.